OK, the final session before the morning break is entitled Liquidated Damages, the New Landscape. Liquidated damages are, of course, pre-ascertained sums paid by one party, typically the contractor, to another party, typically the employer, for a breach of an obligation. And we're most familiar with them in the context of contractor culpable delay to completion, whether that be completion to the whole project or completion to a section. The legal landscape uh, as regards liquidated damages changed, some say materially following judgment in the Supreme Court case of Cavendish and MacDessie in 2015. Then came the first instance decision of Triple Point and PTT in 2018, a case which concerns, amongst other things, the entitlement to liquidated damages following termination. That decision uh, was appealed and the Court of Appeal handed down its decision in 2019. It was appealed again to the Supreme Court and presumably because the Supreme Court was made aware of this very important conference in September, they very kindly handed down judgment in July this year uh, to give our panelists sufficient time uh, to consider it and uh, relay it to you all. So to lead our discussion about these cases and other matters connected with liquidated damages is Chantal Amy Dorius, QC. Chantal is a commercial barrister with over 25 years experience of representing parties in international infrastructure and energy disputes. She practices from Atkin Chambers in London, as well as acting for major infrastructure clients in the UK. She is regularly instructed as counsel on large international arbitrations. And in addition, she is an experienced arbitrator with appointments as chair and co-arbitrator across a range of commercial disputes. She is former chairman of the Bar of England and Wales, co-editor in chief of the International Construction Law Review, and she is the current head of Atkin Chambers, which has been ranked tier one for construction for as long as I have been in practice and most likely longer than that. Chantelle, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm going to start by introducing my panel. Tony Diamond, who sits to my immediate right, is a partner in the International Dispute Resolution Group at Debevoys and Plimpton. He's co-chair of the firm's Asian arbitration practice and pandemics permitting, splits his time between London and Hong Kong. And to his right is Michelle Metz. Michelle is a partner at HKA and leads the European Delay Service offering at HK. She regularly acts as an expert witness on matters in delay, provides assistance with defending and producing EOT claims, and advises clients on programming and reporting procedures. In 18 months, this is her first foray into London and out of her Shropshire idyll. And I think I can speak for all of us that we're delighted to be able to be here, at least with some of you in person, and of course, others uh, down the computer or camera. Now, James has already introduced this morning's topic, liquidated damages, and we don't have very long, but we are going to try and touch on the more recent cases. And many of us, I think, have complained over the last two decades about the lack uh, or a lack of sufficiency of cases coming out of the courts dealing with some of the more important issues uh, in construction law. And it's probably fair to say that uh, the last five years have been an exception to that with quite a number of important cases uh, in relation to liquidated damages. We're also going to try and touch on a comparative element, uh, recognizing the time constraints. I'm afraid this morning we're going to focus on the common law side, recognizing that different questions arise in the civil law field. And if we had another half an hour, we would probably be able to cover that as well. So I'm going to kick off by asking uh, Michelle to start by looking at the seminal Supreme Court decision, which James has already mentioned in Cavendish and McDessie and Parking Eye, and in particular, what makes a provision penal from an English law perspective? Thank you, Chantelle, and uh, thank you for inviting me here today. It's, uh, it's great to be uh, doing some traveling once again and to be here in person and to see everybody. Um, I have to apologize, I will be referring to my notes quite frequently as there's quite a lot to remember on this one. Um, so I'm going to run through um, the pertinent um, case that we've just discussed in terms of the Cavendish versus uh, MacDessie 
um, parking eye and the current test in English law. So I'm just going to run through uh, the overall and some facts and the outcome of that particular case. So in this particular case, the Supreme Court considered a combined appeal. So it's looking at both cases here as to whether certain contractual clauses were imposed a sanction, were unenforceable due to being penalty clauses. So interestingly, in this case, this appeal provides for the first time an opportunity for the Supreme Court to consider the law concerning penalties in approximately 100 years. So that's a long time. So that's why it's a seminal case, as we've just, uh, as James just mentioned. So the Supreme Court judgment in the Cavendish and Parking Eye has provided some clarity on the law regarding penalty clauses and provided an updated rule or a, a, a different test, which we're going to discuss a little bit later on how parties can identify if a clause is an unenforceable penalty clause. I'm just going to run through some of the facts on the two particular cases as briefly as I can do, but I think it's worthwhile going through them because really this sets the scene for the rest of the discussions that we're going to have. So in terms of the MacDessy versus Cavendish, in this particular case, Mr MacDessy agreed to sell Cavendish Square Holdings BV, a controlling stake in the holding company of the largest advertising and marketing communication group in the Middle East. Two clauses of the agreement provided if he breached certain restricted covenants against competing evidence activities, Mr. MacDessy A would not be entitled to receive the final two installments of the sale price, so that's clause 5.1, and B may be obliged to sell his remaining shares to Cavendish as, at a price that excluded the value of the goodwill of the business, that's clause 5.6. McDessie breached the covenants, but argued that clauses 5.1 and 5.6 were unenforceable penalty clauses. The Court of Appeal overturning the trial judge's conclusion agreed. Now, in coming to their decision, the Supreme Court considered the following points. One, whether the rule against penalties applies to commercial contracts negotiated between sophisticated parties. Two, if the rule does apply to some such contracts, whether the clauses are within the scope of the rule on penalty clauses. And three, if the clauses are within the scope of the rule against penalties, whether the Court of Appeal was wrong to conclude that they were penal and therefore unenforceable. So those are the facts with McDessie versus Cavendish. In terms of parking eye, briefly the facts are parking eye um, and the owners of Riverside Retail Park in Chelmsford agreed to manage to cut a car park together. Parking Eye put up several notices around the car park stating that any failure to comply with the two hour parking limit would result in a parking charge of £85. When Mr Beavis outstayed the two hour limit by almost an hour, he argued that the £85 charge was a penalty at common law and therefore unenforceable, and or that the charges were unfair and unforceable by virtue of the unfair terms in the Consumer Contracts Regulation 1999. So in terms of the Cavendish versus MacDessie, the Supreme Court held that the true test for amounts to penalties is, and I'm going to read from the case here, is whether the impunged provision is a secondary obligation which, is, which imposes a detriment on the contract breaker out of all proportion to any legitimate interest of the innocent party in the enforcement of the primary obligation. Now, the innocent party can have no proper interest in simply punishing the defaulter. His interest is in the performance or in some appropriate alternative to performance. In the case of a straightforward damages clause, that interest will rarely extend beyond compensation for breach, and we therefore expect that Lord Dunedin's four tests would usually be perfectly adequate to determine its validity. But compensation is not necessarily the only legitimate interest that the innocent party may have in the performance of the defender's primary obligations. So in particular, any legitimate interest refers to commercial justification, compensation for loss, or any other interest that the innocent parties may have. However, for the clause to be enforceable, 
um, the detriment of the contract breaker needs to be proportionate to the innocent party's legitimate interest. Therefore, it was held that the relevant provisions would not amount to, to a penalty clause. Similarly, in the Parking Eye case, it was held that, in our opinion, where the penalty rule is plainly engaged, the £85 charge is not a penalty. The reason is that although Parking Eye was not liable to suffer loss as a result of the oversaying motorists, it had a legitimate interest in charging them, which, is, which extended beyond the recovery of any loss. As we have pointed out, uh, deference is not penal if there is a legitimate interest in influencing the conduct of the contracting party, which is not satisfied by the mere right to recover damages by the breach of contract. None of this means that parking eyes could charge overstayers whatever they liked. It could not charge them a sum which would be out of all proportion to its interest or that the landowner for whom it is providing the service. But there is no reason to suppose that the £85 is out of all proportion to its interest. So basically, the new test was really, is the penalty clause engaged? And if so, is there a is the contractual provision penal? So really, I thought it was necessary to go through it in a little bit of detail because it sets the scene. Thank you, Michelle. That's very helpful. Now, when we when we come to look at this new test, which which is really a question of legitimate interest, I wanted to ask Tony for his perspective on on how how much of a shift this is from where we were before, and what sort of impact that may have on construction disputes. Thanks, Chantal. Um, I think the answer is it's very difficult to say yet. Uh, you know, uh, the leading judgment makes it very clear, uh, both Lord Sumption and, and uh, uh, Lord Newberger make it clear that in most commercial contexts, the old test in Dunlop will still apply and um, looking at whether it's a genuine pre-estimate will be the appropriate test. But in some contexts, they say it's appropriate to look beyond that uh, and to look at whether there is a legitimate interest that's being protected by the uh, by the um, sanction. Um, the problem is that we don't really have good guidance about when we can look beyond that and how we undertake the balancing, uh, the, the balancing test, the proportionality test. And actually, I think parking eye itself is a very good illustration of this. I mean, what, what the court decided in Parking Eye was, well, Parking Eye's business model was to give two hours of free parking uh, and to extract from overstayers sufficient money to run their operations and no doubt to turn a handsome profit as well. Well, and that was a legitimate, that was a legitimate interest worthy of protection. But if that is a legitimate interest worthy of protection. Why is it not also a legitimate uh, interest to, for example, impose hefty liquidated damages on um, contractors who fail to deliver their projects on time with the commercial objective of shoring up the balance sheet of, a, of an owner? I, I find it very difficult to see a difference between the two. So I think we have to sort of wait and watch and see how this is developed uh, over the course of time. I think it's, it was clearly intended to be um, a significant departure uh, from what had gone before. Um, when you read the judgments, um, uh, essentially what they're doing, particularly the leading judgment, is that they, they, they go back to Dunlop and uh, they uh, uh, review uh, Lord Dunedin's um, uh, opinion there, but they also look in particular at Lord Atkins' opinion there and pick up a different line of authority, and they stress that line of authority, which is the legitimate expectation or legitimate interest line of authority, and they clearly intend it to be a significant departure. And and look, I mean, I think we have to recognise that there are problems with the old test. Um, there's no doubt about that. I mean, the classic problem, um, I think, is uh, public authorities. Um, so, you know, you build a hospital, a hospital is delivered late. Um, what l loss does the, does the owner of the hospital suffer? What, how, what's a genuine pre-estimate of that loss? And, you know, it does seem appropriate to, to be able to uh, uh, sanction 
um, uh, contractors who are late delivering public infrastructure, but it's not always obvious what a genuine pre-estimate would be in those circumstances. And I think this test does enable those sorts of provisions to be enforced in those circumstances. But, but we are left with a very uncertain, uncertain field, I think. Interesting. I mean, it's probably fair to say, isn't it, that in the construction field, there are very few instances of uh, liquidated damages not being upheld. I mean, even prior to this case. Yeah, I think that's right. And I, I think, I think um, we'll see it even more rarely now. Mm. Um, uh, and, um, you know, their lordships considered whether the, the rule should be abolished. Uh, uh, and, um, and in fact, not only did they consider it, but it's been considered in every jurisdiction where um, the parking eye decision has been has been looked at. So it's been, you know, considered in Singapore, I think we'll touch on that, and in Australia as well. And the courts in all of those jurisdictions considered whether the rule should be abolished. And certainly the Supreme Court here said, well, we wouldn't invent it today if it didn't exist, um, but but it's been around for such a long time. And, and you know, our brothers across and brothers and sisters across the Commonwealth all use it and and probably it has some role to play. Uh, and so they, 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 they didn't abolish it. Um, uh, but I suspect that we will see it very, very rarely employed. Michelle, move, moving across the world to Australia, um, how does the, the position contrast there? And I was thinking particularly about the High Court decision in Andrews and ANZ banking. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it does differ there. Um, as you so rightly say, I mean, the difference being in the MacDussie case, it follows that there needs to be a breach of the contract um, for uh, the doctrine against the penalty clauses to apply. That is not the case, as I understand it, with the Andrews case. The High Court of Australia um, reconsidered and restated the doctrine without reference to breach of the contract. Um, so that, my understanding, is the main difference um, between the two. And the Supreme Court, in particular, uh, Lords Newberger and Sumption in McDessey, referred to this decision as being a, a radical departure from the previous understanding. Tony, how... I was going to say, do you agree? That may be invidious of me to ask, but do you agree? And do, do you think, again, that this aspect, so not, not the test, but rather when it could be applied or when it can be applied, um, is going to have an impact on the construction industry? Um, uh, well, to taking the first of those first, do I think it's radical? Yes, I do think it's radical. I mean, uh, his historically in the common law world, it has been confined to uh, breaches of contract. Uh, and to extend it beyond breaches of contract means that it can be engaged in, for example, um, take or pay clauses under uh, you know, long term supply agreements. Uh, you could see it being argued that those are penal when uh, you've effectively got an alternative method of performance, which involves the payment of cash. Um, and um, the courts in the UK historically have said, look, it just doesn't apply in those circumstances. We're not dealing with breach. So, so you know, the, 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 the doctrine doesn't apply. I think on the broader test, the Australian test, there would certainly be an argument about whether it would apply in those circumstances. So I do see it as a radical departure. Impact on the construction industry? Um, I, I don't see much because traditionally our uh, contracts are drafted so that liquidated damages apply when there has been a breach, the failure to deliver the uh, project by a due completion date. Um, um, that said, one could certainly see people trying to structure construction contracts so that liquidated damages don't apply merely where there's been a breach. You could, you, you, and I think this is a problem with the old test that that it's actually difficult to justify other than by sort of reference to historical accident, because wherever you've got a contract that provides for damages to be payable on a breach, it's always possible to rewrite that contract in some other way to achieve exactly the same effect. Um, uh, and, uh, to do it in the construction context, for example, I think one way you could do it is, is you, you could provide that a contractor has a license to occupy the site 
until the completion of the works, that that license is uh, rent free until a particular date, and that after that date, the contractor must pay rent for the occupation of the of, of the of the uh, site. And now that will achieve, I think, exactly the same effect as a liquidated damages clause, but on the narrow scope, the English scope, because there's been no breach of contract, um, it's, it, it, the penalties doctrine isn't engaged. Whereas on the Australian view, arguably it is engaged and, and the Australian courts could strike down the rent as a, as a, as a penal provision. Really interesting. And, and I think it flags the importance of, of drafting in a sense and perhaps some of the challenges that, that lawyers or that we as lawyers will have in the future when grappling with uh, LAD provisions. Probably more, it's fair to say, I would think in the international context, because I mean, the message from the Supreme Court, both in uh, MacDessie and in other cases, seems to be uh, that where you have two commercial parties, both represented by lawyers, uh, a sort of detailed commercial contract, that the court will be slow to interfere with the commercial bargain. Uh, and so, in your example, Tony, I think even even if you even if you were unsuccessful in getting around the application, the reality is that the court would need some persuading even to be interested in looking at this, wouldn't they? Really? Look, I think I think that's right. And as, as I said, you know, the, all of the courts have looked at abolishing the rule. My sense is that many courts around the world world will now kind of allow it to wither on the vine. Interesting. Michelle, looking at um, moving on to triple point and uh, the decision that James mentioned that we now have, um, although it's taken us over two years to get there, um, and in a way interesting on two fronts. One, because it's an example that you can successfully appeal the Court of Appeal decision, even where specialist judges are involved, not always something that is um, recognised. Uh, and two, uh, the fact that it restored really what was seen to be the conventional position. Perhaps you could just briefly fill us in on the current Yeah, I think, I think we might have been having a slightly different conversation if the Court of Appeal decision had been upheld, but it wasn't. Um, and in that particular case, the Court of Appeal had previously held that the, the clause didn't entitle the customer to claim liquidated damages. At that time, it was a case of termination, basically, because um, they had only completed some of the work. They'd never completed all of the work. So the work was never completed and accepted. And in the Court of Appeal, they considered basically that the customer's remedy in that particular case was just general damages of delay and the LD's provision didn't apply. However, we've now got uh, the Supreme Court decision, as James said very recently in July 2021, so a couple of months ago, which basically has overturned that decision. And they basically looked at it and said, well, we've decided that we're going back to the conventional um, terms here and the correct, correct construction of the clause was that liquidated damages accrued for the period of time from the due date of delivery, so when the plan completion date should have been until termination of the contract. Um, so in other words, liquidators, liquidated damages would be applied in that particular case from the plan completion to when termination accrued. So uh, they overturned that case and, and restored normality, shall, shall we say. So really, that's just it in a nutshell. I don't think that there was a huge amount of point of spending a huge amount of time on it. Um, Interesting. It been different. I, I agree, as Michelle says, it might have been different if the Court of Appeals decision had been upheld. I mean, I think the interesting question in a way remains that, as with so many of these cases, often ultimately it's the particular clause that's being considered. And although the judgments uh, discuss points of principle. In fact, when one looks even at this one, I imagine that a really, really clearly drafted clause that made provision for uh, those liquidated damages which had accrued uh, no longer being liquidated damages which um, were to be treated as due and uh, owing, if there were to be a termination, then I can imagine a different result. Um, but as you say, give, given uh, the Supreme Court decision, on what was probably a fairly conventional clause um, back, back to where we were before. Now, conscious of time, I want to move on to the next issue on liquidated damages, and that is really the question of cap. Can LADs uh, 
which are held to be unenforceable, still effectively provide some protection, but protection the other way around, protection to the party who would have been paying the LDs, can they operate as a cap? Uh, and again, that's an area where we've had some recent decisions in two different jurisdictions. I'm going to start with Tony and ask him to give us the English law perspective and EcoWorld Ballymore Embassy Gardens. Thanks, Chantal. Um, so, look, I, I, th I think this was an area where we all thought another another area where we all thought we knew the answer. Um, and um, as we'll discover, we now have some conflicting decisions on it. Um, so. Um, EcoWorld was an, it was an interesting case where uh, the um, owner had taken partial possession of the premises uh, and then wanted to argue, firstly, that the liquidated damages clause was no longer enforceable because obviously liquidated damages were payable for failure to deliver the whole of the works and part of the works had already been delivered, so it doesn't make sense to apply the whole of the liquidated damages. And so argue that those had fallen away, but then to argue that their actual losses were in excess of uh, the liquidated damages uh, uh, for the, the cap on liquidated damages provided for in the contract, um, which I personally think pretty sneaky, um, uh, <laughs> brave, <laughs> uh, um, um, and, um, you know, not surprisingly, in my view, the court was really not having any of it. Firstly, they held on the first point um, that uh, the liquidated damages clause was in fact enforceable. Uh, 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 and so, in truth, they didn't need to go on to decide the second point. So it's strictly, I think, speaking, it's strictly speaking, it's obiter, but the court found that in that case, the provision in the contract which said that the cap on liquidated damages is, I think it was 7% of the contract price, should apply to the general damages for delay that um, uh, the owner would have been entitled to in lieu of liquidated damages which had, had, had fallen away. I interestingly, as far as I can tell, there was no discussion about whether the daily rate for liquidated damages would operate as a cap on the daily general damages that the that the owner was entitled to recover. Um, I personally have always taken the view that probably does, um, but as we'll see, other jurisdictions have gone in a different way. Thanks, Tony. And I, I think that's right. I mean, it is interesting that the clause made that distinction, didn't it, between I think it was a weekly rate of 25,000 up to an aggregate maximum of 7% um, of the final trade contract sum. And it's that maximum of 7%, which in this case, the court uh, or, or the parties arguing and therefore the court alight upon. Uh, Michelle, what about Singapore and the Crescendus Bionics case? Does yeah, well, right? that's that's in contrast to the eco world. So we so we uh, have a, a, a different view taken in Singapore, basically, whereas in that particular case, so that's the Crescenda case, um, the court held that the amount of general damages recoverable by the plaintiff should not be capped uh, by the amount of liquidated damages that the plaintiff would have been entitled to under the contract. Um, so um, the judge's view, basically, they made that decision because they said that there's different considerations underpinning general damages and liquidated damages, basically saying that in particular, general damages are compensatory for the actual losses suffered by the innocent party, um, whereas, the gen whereas the liquidated damages are intended to be a genuine pre-estimate of the likely losses suffered, etc. So, yeah, so we've got two different points of view, basically, from the two different jurisdictions there, one saying capped, one saying not capped for the general damages. Interesting. And, and again, of course, a different clause. So, so yeah. in Michelle's case, there wasn't that um, that extra bit, if I can put it that way, although Tami has said that, and I think I would agree with him, that that probably shouldn't matter. But certainly in the English court, there was, there was the extra provision, wasn't there, of the absolute cap, the 7%. James, I think you were indicating a moment ago that there might be some questions. I was. The questions have again come in uh, thick and fast, uh, no doubt, uh, as a result of the quality of this uh, session and the interest in it. So um, I'll, I'll work through them. We will extend past, uh, a little bit past, 10 past uh, 
10 past 11 uh, BST so that we can deal with some of these questions. The first is uh, anonymous. Uh, it's it, it's um, whether it's a question or, or, or request for advice, uh, you can be the judge. We have a project with a JV where they represented themselves on a 75 25 uh, sharing during tender after the project was awarded the reverse happened where supposedly minor party had majority representation in the project in terms of both resources and uh, personnel can we terminate this contract on the basis of misrepresentation um, I think that rather uh, sits in the advice category so let me let me move on uh, this question is from Steve Logan um, reference is made to triple point to the first instance case of Hall and van der Heiden where Coulson J awarded liquidated damages beyond the date of termination to the date when the replacement contractor completed the works. It appears that the terms were the JCT minor works and the defendant was unrepresented. Although this example seems out of the norm, it was not rejected by the Supreme Court. So the question is, um, in what circumstances of contract and circumstances is this approach likely to succeed and if I can just ask one of you to answer it so we can get through the questions. Uh, I, I, I don't know the specific case but um, I, obviously it's going to turn on the on, on the express wording of the contract and uh, I think um, given the decision in, in triple point you will need pretty clear words to achieve that that object. It's not uncommon though I think it is pretty sloppy drafting to come across contracts which provide that liquidated dam the liquidated damages clauses uh, survive termination. But that actually begs a bit of a question. Um, uh, it, it eliminates the approach of the Court of Appeal in Triple Point, which is to say that liquidated damages disappear altogether, but it leaves open two possible alternatives. Uh, those are the alternatives that the Supreme Court went for in Triple Point, i.e. that accrued liquidated damages survive termination and also the possibility in the case to which you referred James uh, uh, that liquidated damages continue to run until the replacement contractor has completed. So um, I, I, I think I'm slightly avoiding answering the question but I, I, but, but I think if you want to achieve that end you should aim for clearer wording than simply liquidated damages clause survives termination. Certainly if you want certainty. <laughs> Um, another anonymous question, uh, liquidated damages are supposed to be compensatory for the employer's potential loss and not to be penal in nature. Uh, the speaker, though, has a very valid point as to how this applies to government infrastructure projects where it is not supposed to be commercially operated for profit. However, the loss here is the delayed provision of public services. How do you calculate that? I, I suppose picking up Tony's point and picking up the questioner, um, one of the interesting things of the um, Supreme Court decision and its focus on legitimate interest being protected is that it, I, I suppose it provides a route whereby commercial parties are in fact able to protect that interest without um, necessarily having to prove or face a challenge uh, as to whether there is an actual loss. Uh, and therefore whether the uh, level of liquidated damages in any way reflects those likely losses. Um, so if anything, I would think that um, the Supreme Court decision in that sense is helpful. Um, and you see it in a way in the McDessey case where um, the so-called penal consequences, which were not held to be penal, um, in the particular commercial arrangement were pretty extraordinary, certainly for, for lay people um, and way beyond any likely loss and yet the court was willing to accept that there were genuine commercial um, reasons in other words there was a, a genuine a proper legitimate interest which was being protected and I say again I think the court's willingness um, and we see this across a number of cases the court's willingness to step back and not interfere at, this is the, the English courts in commercial contracts between two parties who've had the benefit of, of lawyers drafting and where you have a, if I can put it this way, a, a fairly substantially drafted contract. The courts seem to these days be stepping back. Um, next question, 
can you please let us know the stance of LDs being penal in certain parts of the Middle East? Examples given at Amman, UAE, Kuwait, Qatar, or Saudi Arabia. Um, I, can have a, I can have a little bit of a stab at that, but uh, I, 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 you know, I'm not an expert in uh, um, Middle East law, but I've obviously done a number of projects there. Um, my understanding is that the provisions in most of these jurisdictions, and there are significant differences between jurisdictions, that the provisions are typically not penal in the sense that they won't be struck down, but that in many, if not most of the jurisdictions, uh, there is an opportunity to adjust those limited, those liquidated damages if they don't, if and to the extent they don't reflect the actual loss. And as you move from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, the test that you, is applied is different. Um, so, for example, just to mention one I know, in Amman, for example, if you can demonstrate that your actual loss was either greater if you're the owner or less if you're the contractor, then, then the court or tribunal will uh, substitute uh, the, actual, the actual loss. Whereas in Egypt, uh, if you want to increase the damages, you really have to show that the um, uh, that there's there's been a major problem with the way that the that the uh, liquidated damages themselves were negotiated and that it couldn't possibly reflect the actual loss. So it's it's a much higher um, a much higher hurdle to to cross. But I think that's the the, the general principle uh, is that there can be an adjustment to reflect the actual loss, and that is obviously very different from the common law world, with its focus on hypothetical loss. Uh, so, you know, Dunlop test is, is this a genuine pre-estimate? No reference at all to actual loss um, uh, in order to strike down the liquidated damages provision. Whereas in the Middle East, um, entirely a focus on the actual loss and a comparison with the liquidated damages provision. What, one of the interesting questions I always have, so I, sh I shouldn't really be asking a question, I'm certainly not going to ask this of Tony, but um, one of the things I've often been asked is, well, how often um, do tribunals actually apply um, the ability in the Middle East to um, alter or amend or adjust liquidated damages? And I've certainly been involved in a number of cases where that has been argued. And what I'm not so clear about, unfortunately, because most of the arbitration cases aren't reported, is how often tribunals actually go down that route. Um, next question, uh, continuing to reflect the international nature of our um, delegates. Are LDs always awarded against the contractor? Are there no circumstances where the employer causes the delays slash breach in contract completion? The second scenario is almost always common in the Nigerian construction landscape. I, I guess it depends a little bit on the contractual arrangements, but I mean, as, as a generality, um, assuming that you have a contract which would uh, award the contractor an extension of time for the employer caused delay, uh, then obviously the LDs and most uh, standard form contracts would uh, only bite on the culpable delay period and so wouldn't be awarded in relation to that delay, which was actually a critical delay, which was caused uh, by the employer. And obviously, if you're looking at a situation where the contract doesn't provide for that employer caused critical delay, then you're in the territory of being able to, to effectively challenge the applicability um, of the liquidated damages provision and, and in layman's terms, try and bust the clause so that the employer can't rely on them at all. Perhaps I, I, I picked up a slightly different question, which is, are there any circumstances hmm. in which we see liquidated damages provisions being provided for in favor of the contractor? Um, uh, and um, you know, typically, we see sort of general damages being claimed by contractors rather than liquidated damages. Some contracts don't provide for liquidated damages. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I, 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 there's no reason in principle why you couldn't provide for liquidated damages in favour of a contractor. Um, I, I don't think I've ever seen it done. I have, I have seen. I mean, I have seen on one occasion a contract where. Um, in effect, there was a, a figure in the contract for what the contractor could claim for prolongation 
um, for which it was able to establish an extension of time. Um, and so that would be yeah. a, effectively along those lines, I suppose, um, a contractually agreed rate for such losses. Okay, next question. Um, would it be sufficient to satisfy uh, the test? And I assume uh, the writer means the test whether the liquidated damages provision is penal or not. Would it be sufficient to satisfy the test if you wrote within a damages clause that the parties agree the limit of damages set is protecting a legitimate business interest and is proportionate? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think the courts will look at the, at the substance and not the form. <laughs> All right. Uh, final question then. I'm looking hopefully into the in-person audience who've been very quiet, presumably waiting for a, cu a cup of morning coffee. But, but uh, final question from the online delegates. If LAD, LADs are not set as sole and exclusive remedy for delay, set as a sole and exclusive remedy for delay, can general damages also be claimed for? Um, look, I think I think in in most cases, it, um, courts and tribunals will approach clauses like this and construe them in such a way as that it's it's implied, it's understood that they are the exclusive remedy for delay. And there have been a number of uh, I think English decisions along those lines. I I, I recall one involving Bifa. I, I can't remember the name of the case uh, where where that issue came up for consideration. And I think the general approach will be liquidated damages are the remedy for delay. Uh, um, uh, that there are always some interesting issues around the edges about you know are, whether claims that are being made are in fact disguised delay claims. So, for example. Um, uh, super, uh, the, the owner's extended supervision costs or various other bits and pieces and then you get into an argument is that really a disguised delay claim which is eclipsed by the liquidated damages provision but I think the general principle is tolerably clear. Excellent all right well we will now take a break until 11:40 uh, BST when we will uh, return for a session on uh, disruption if you are online, please leave Teams running or you can just log back in. Uh, but please all join me in thanking Chantel, Tony and Michelle for an excellent session.